righty. So like Danielle said, we're going to go over how AI is forming and kind of changing the way that we actually create things and allowing us to rethink that. Um, so this is one of my favorite slides and I love talking about this. You know, if you look at the picture to the very far left, that's kind of where we started. You know, we had a room full of minds drafting things, figuring out how the angles and all different perspectives and how to draw that from a top view, side view. And then came along CAD, which, you know, didn't necessarily automate that, but it made it a lot easier to then create a lot of that artwork. And then now people are asking themselves, is the server room going to be the future studio? Are we all just going to offload our thoughts onto the server in the cloud and just have the GPUs do all the design work and AI is going to change the world? But so that's what this pro that's what this talk's all about. The next leap and basically going over how AI is actually changing a lot of the creative tasks that we do every day as artists and designers like you guys. So um, I just like putting this in here because these are kind of actually new emerging job titles that are kind of based around some of these new methods of creation. So you guys have probably heard of prompting, but these are just some examples like a senior prompt artist or an associate data set curator or a hyper-targeted ad director. These are new emerging job roles around the technology. You know, we saw this happen in history with CAD. Once CAD came out, the job role, a CAD modeler or an A-class surfacer came from the technology. So it's interesting just to see how technology derives to these new roles within the studio that normally wouldn't have been there before. And so here's kind of how that actually is starting to look and how AI is actually starting to play its role in the creative process. You know, before the human was the part of the entire loop, but now when you have a machine in the loop, the human can actually propose the problems. The machine's responsibility is to create the choices and then the human is still in the loop to then, you know, uh, choose which of those choices is actually, you know, usable for their exact use case. And that's kind of the new iteration process of human and machine. It's divergence and convergence, uh, collaborative process. And here's kind of a visual of what that looks like. So, you know, before and how a lot of people still work today, you have, let's say, a drawing and then you maybe spend an hour or a while or like maybe a few hours trying to color it, shade it, figuring out what those values are. But now with AI using Viscom, you can just have one sketch and then the AI can give you many, many different choices of what it thinks of what you're trying to draw. And then it kind of becomes up to you then to decide which one of those drawings or design concepts is the best for your particular use case. And this is kind of becoming the new creative process for a lot of artists and designers. So yeah. Human authorship and direction is becoming more and more critical piece of the design process because machines are really, really good at certain things and really, really bad at certain things. For example, speed, precision, variation. These are all things that AI just inherently is really good at because of its fundamental properties. But however, humans are still much, much better, much, much better at other aspects of the process, such as actual design, empathy and generalization. Since we are humans designing objects and products for other humans, it's it just only makes sense that we still stay in the loop to keep that sense of authorship when bringing those products to life. Um, so this is something we actually really pay attention to at Viscom is how do we actually unlock the creative potential for artists and designers instead of actually just replacing them, which is what a lot of other companies are trying to do. Um, so here's an example of what that actually looks like uh, using Viscom. So you have your sketch and then you have a text description of what it was you're trying to draw. And then you're actually able to then generate these high fidelity renderings of what exactly it is you're trying to do. So you no longer have to, you know, keep doing all these paths, all these like color shading and rendering things by hand. You can simply just stick in the doodle phase and make a lot of changes there. And then using text as kind of a, a new paintbrush to articulate what exactly it is you're trying to make. And this is kind of a new way of people's uh, uh, way of creating things and just rethinking even how you make stuff. You know, it's like we already as artists and designers use our words and wave handing as a part of just a, a, like a translation layer of what we're thinking. So it's cool to see these tools kind of build around that and become a natural way of doing that. Um, here's some more ideas and some more visuals of how that looks. So these drawings up top actually were the the, the, the inputs for the AI to work from to then generate these renderings at the bottom. So the one on the very far left here was like a, 
uh, a North Face shoe was like, I think I put, and then for this one, it was like a Puma running shoe. So it's just interesting that it's also brand agnostics when it comes to being able to generate these designs. And then here's kind of what a co-designing uh, process looks like in the automotive space. You know, you have this input sketch and then you have your text prompts and then you're able to generate all these different car designs. Now, if you were to try to do these four renderings, anyone in the chat right now, if any of you guys, I don't I wanna know how long it would possibly take you guys to do all four of these uh, by hand, <laughs> like a sketch, to then rendering it, pathing it out, and having it be so clean. Um, it would just take so long. At least it would take me a few hours. So this is just a really quick glimpse of how AI is actually accelerating um, the creative process. Some more, and, and then, yeah, you can get basically an unlimited amount of ideas around a singular theme. So if you have a key sketch, you can then get multiple iterations of that key sketch of what that would look like all through the artificial intelligence in just a matter of minutes or seconds. So for example, in this picture, you know, we have this one drawing and then just from that one drawing, we're able to generate an infinity amount of ideas of what that could look like. And, you know, there might be something you guys see in these drawings that I wouldn't have seen or your manager might not have seen. So it's just kind of creates a new conversation around design as well. It's really interesting. The stuff's uh, pretty fascinating. And yeah, it also can work for interiors, even detailed products. So here's a steering wheel that was actually drawn inside of Viscom and then a text description to help finish out what that drawing should look like. And I don't know about you guys, but I was always really bad at drawing steering wheels. And this just makes it a lot easier because now, you know, with these new tools, with artificial intelligence, it really allows you to focus more on actually being creative in the actual ideas around the concept rather than the execution. You're not having to like worry about, oh, is my perspective right? Or is the lighting, how do I shade this color with the leather, da, da, like all that stuff. You can just really focus on like, okay, does this look cool? Is the proportions nice? Like things like that, like actual design concepts. And this one's actually really crazy. Um, here's another interior one that was generated from this simple kind of like blob doodle thing on the left here. And once again, just another really quick and easy way to explore different themes, you know, and when you're in the sketch phase, as we all know, that's the part where you can make changes the quickest. You know, the further and further you develop a design concept, it becomes harder and harder to explore and iterate other opportunities when doing so. So that's why we're really focused kind of on that early prototype phase of the paper to production pipeline and just kind of making sure that people can explore as many ideas as possible in the time that they're given. <clears throat> um, so, yeah. So this is kind of the new workflow for a creative task. Uh, you can see in this chart on the right here, you know, we have inspiration, ideation, refine, and finalization. And before, uh, the human was kind of the entire part of that process as we started out as a very loose thing, getting all the way to the finer details. But nowadays, you're starting to see the human and machine part take over the early parts of the process. And then the human is more so responsible for the refinement and finalization of those designs. So this is kind of, you know, the, the overall theme of the talk, you know, it's just this this is really forcing people to rethink how they actually go about doing this stuff. It's, uh, it's a really interesting time and I'm really excited to see, you know, this future of human and machines collaborating for a lot of this stuff. Um, and then, yeah, so this is kind of like our, it's like a sneak peek into things that we're working on now is like, how do we actually redefine um, how, how we make 3D objects. You know, we're also used to things like Autodesk Alias, uh, Polygonal Modeling, NURBS, uh, ZBrush, and those still require a little bit of technicalities that take you out of, you know, your 2D drawing uh, comfortable space, I should say. You know, drawing is such a natural way of communicating ideas, so why can't we just stay drawing and then just get 3D from the 2D drawings? So that's something that we're working on. It's like, how do you then, you know, bridge that gap of translation of 2D to 3D and allowing people to explore 3D objects a lot faster while staying in the 2D medium. So super excited for that and really curious to see how this is all going to unfold as well. Cool. And then here's kind of just like more uh, looks into like the technology around that. So essentially, yeah, you can have an image and then this is actually a pretty old paper, but you can have an image and then the AI will be able to essentially just reconstruct what that image should look like. I'm not going to go too deep into the technicals around that because this is a more of a creative artistic talk, but 
you can just already imagine the possibilities if all you had to do was worry about what something looks like in 2D and you automatically get the 3D objects from that. Uh, it just saves you so much time. And now we're starting to see things where you can actually generate, uh, you can start generating videos from text. So similar to how you can generate images from text, videos is the next thing. So for example, all these videos you guys are seeing, this is actually a research coming out of Facebook, by the way, but it's just to kind of inspire you and to show you what's next. Uh, a video of a teddy bear painting a portrait. I don't know where else you would actually find that video, but uh, you can actually generate it, which is so cool. And this is very dangerous technology, actually, which is why Meta probably hasn't released this as like an open source thing, because you could have, you can you can just generate, if you can generate a video of anything, um, I don't even need to really tell you guys what's possible there, but yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. And then text to 3D is something else as well. Um, being able to just similar how you can do a text to an image, what if you can do text to 3D? So if you want a DSLR photo of a squirrel, well, why not? The AI can do that. So this is just kind of, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't publicly available yet, but just to show you guys of what's coming and then maybe how you guys can start rethinking the way you create things, considering that this kind of technology is gonna be readily available. Um, craftsmanship is still gonna be a thing maybe, but uh, a lot less emphasis on the execution of your ideas and more so on the actual ideas themselves. Um, so yeah, that's essentially the talk there, guys. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any, there's probably a lot of questions and things, but that's essentially, you know, the ethos of VizCom, the area that we work in. Um, our whole model is, you know, how do we actually shorten the distance between having an idea and actually bringing it to life with artificial intelligence? So, um, super happy to answer any questions and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here so I can, uh, see the, see the chat. Um, NVIDIA Deep Learning Solutions Data Science. Okay, cool. For anyone hoping to engage directly with training models. Oh, yeah. You can, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, Daniela. So that was the, <laughs> that was the talk. Sorry. I was like looking at the chat, but um, cool. Yeah. That was, that was basically it there. Um, Do we, yeah. can we, can we get a live demo, Jordan? Of this oh, oh, a live demo. Um, yes. Let me see if, okay, let me see if this drawing tablet will work. If not, I can just use my mouse, but I will try to give you guys a live demo as well. Hold on here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me grab my drawing pen. Cool. Does this pen work with this? No, it doesn't. Okay. I'll just use my mouse. No worries. <laughs> um, Chief Technology. Who's David? David Nelsoner. Okay. Let me share my screen here. Free. Will Viscom offer a free? Yes. We're like working on that. <laughs> Every single day we get at least five students asking like, can we please get this for free? And it's something we're definitely working on. Um, easier said than done, but because, you know, <laughs> you got to like verify the emails and stuff. But yes, something we're definitely working on. Um, okay, so this is VizCom right now. And I will try to give you guys a live demo. I'm so sorry right now. I don't have my Wacom tablet, but I have a trackpad. Oh, wait, I have my mouse. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry, Danielle. Hold on one second here. Let me grab. Ah, here's my mouse. Okay, cool. Let's make the demo much, much easier. All right, cool. Let me get this hooked up for you guys. Awesome. Okay, cool. We're in here. So yeah, this is Viscom. And so usually what I like to do, I'll, I'll do a car demo because there's probably a lot of car designers in here. When you're usually drawing or sketching something within Viscom, you want to use Render Pen. Render Pen is basically the thing that allows you to render your line drawings before you add the text description. So we're going to come over here. I'm going to draw a beautiful car design. Whoops. Let's come over here. Whoops. You guys are probably much better at drawing than I am. But hey, with AI, you actually don't really need to be like the best drawer in the world. But however, it does very much stick to how well can you actually draw. These things aren't going to make you a better artist or designer per se. However, um, it still very much requires a lot of fundamental understanding of how art design works in some ways. Um, okay, so we'll have like some kind of cool car sketch coming along here and then we'll have this and then we'll say this line and then something like this cool and say like the window goes like that and let's erase some of this here and then just create this awesome
Well, I think we lost Jordan there. And this basically adds the, the one, two, three values. So now what we can do is, is actually describe what it is we're trying to do here. So we can say we're trying to build a 3D render of a car design concept. Um, let's say it's by Toyota. And we want to use Unreal Engine as the, the thing to kind of uh, uh, dictate the visual style. Now, this prompt. Prompting is something I don't really think is going to be here in the future, but it's what people use now. Um, but it's the way to basically essentially describe what it is you want. Um, for example, you know, if we were to run this again, oh, oh, oh yeah. So another thing is the, the image influence. So if I turn this down, let's say to like 40 or like 38%. Now, what that essentially will do is it will it'll dictate to the AI how much do I want to my original image that I had to influence the final result. So you'll see here versus this one and this one, you'll notice that now that I've turned this down some, we are going a little bit further away from my original design, but there's still some design language that stuck through from this image, such as like the proportion, the height, the length, all of those kind of things. Um, so that's kind of like one way that you can modify your, uh, your, your rendering without maybe changing too much. Um, let's try one more time, just to explore. And then I will, I will go. And then Danielle, if there's any questions or anything in the chat or if anyone's saying anything in chat, I can't see it right now, but. Uh, yeah. Um, is, is this come? Uh, oh, okay. That, you already answered that one. This one, I wonder how up and coming designers of the future my kid will see tools like this. Oh, I think we're losing Jordan. Jordan, are you still there? Used for something. And say if I change oh. this to Tesla instead of Toyota, um, let's see what that does. You can actually send back in the original rendering as well. So if I want to just change the rendering that came from the AI, you can keep sending that back inside the model to then get different, different, more and more different results. So this one's not too much different because I had the image influence pretty high. But if we if we take this and then maybe make the image influence like 21% and then we click render, you'll see how much different it would be from that initial image. Um, so let's give it a few seconds here. And then I'll show you guys some other uh, cool stuff. So yeah, you'll see how it's starting Jordan, to get really great. Yeah. It yep. says, uh, one question, what do you mean by not having prompts in the future? Oh, okay. So prompting is just not a really natural way as artists and designers, you know, we don't really use words only to design stuff. So I think people are going to start being able to implement things like their mood boards, their favorite song, um, their favorite photo albums from their phone as ways to help quote unquote prompt the model instead of having to say Unreal Engine, Toyota, Car design concept 3d like you won't have to have these like paragraphs but instead you can use a lot of visuals or other aspects as the inputs of the prompts so that's what i mean more so when i say prompting won't necessarily be a thing much longer uh i, I just don't think people will be typing paragraphs there won't be like a room of people typing out their thoughts they're going to be using other mediums as inspiration kind of like how we do today you know you, you make a mood board use that mood board to dictate your sketch and then you have like a design of some sort. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. I'd like to welcome our guest speakers for some Q and A. So welcome oh. Joey and Austin. Cool. Holy cow. That's unbelievable. David Gabriel. <laughs> are the Viscom created? They are 2d images, but great Photoshop images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 3D stuff's coming soon, guys. Like, I'm really uh, stoked about that. Yo, Joey. Hey, what's up? How's it going? What's up, man? Pretty good. Joey. Any questions, um, Joey, for Jordan? Yeah, I got a, I got a couple. I, you answered a few of my questions I already had, but um, there was one thing about uh, you showed a, where you can have it generate like renders that look like they're 3D renders, right? And then you showed yeah. something that um is was the one that was showing a 3d model is that actually generating a 3d model that you can then you know edit and bring into gravity or you know other softwares yeah like an obj file stl fbx yeah anything yep gotcha um so like do you i guess 
I think you kind of brought it up a little bit, but I think it might vary um, industry to industry, like from cars or footwear or just products in, in general, or even like just image or even like animation type stuff. But like, at what point do you think that this like AI is going to, um, like, I guess what, what unnecessary parts of like design that people do, do you think AI will kind of help it, like things that we do that we don't need to be doing and focus better on the actual problem and solution type thing? Yeah, totally. Things like, you know, the color shading, rendering, the actual modeling process, like, you know, br importing a side view and then having to like take a square and like extend, 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 like mm -hmm. extrude, extrude, like that whole thing, I think things that take away from the creativity, you know, when I'm like, if I have a sketch and I'm just like coloring and shading it, that's a very mundane thing. At least like <laughs> to me, it feels that way. Like I was a car designer before doing any of this stuff at Honda. And like, I did like a lot of design stuff, studied industrial design. And I always felt like the visualization of the drawings was super tedious and not really something that honestly made me feel creative. It was just, it felt like I was like a manual kind of like just doing busy work. So mm -hmm. things that kind of give off that feeling, I think are going to kind of be the things that are going to be automated. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hey, Jordan, this is Austin. Uh, I do have one question I thought was really neat. So first of all, I had some time to play around with it, and it's an amazing tool. I had a blast. I'm not very good <laughs> at drawing, so um, it was really helpful. Um, something that was interesting to me from a footwear side was just thinking about a designer who may potentially have a design already. Can they bring that design into the platform plug in that and then generate a handful of uh, sort of like alternative designs from that by yeah. sliding that slider. So, you know, you're getting a variation of forms and shapes that maybe you wouldn't have thought of that help sort of like influence other designs moving forward. Um, totally. Is that, is that possible? Very possible. You do that right now, actually. Yeah. You can import your own drawing, prompt it, and then just start getting a bunch of results. Um, and you know what, that brings up a really interesting point. This is maybe a little bit off topic, but, for example, like a lot of companies, like a uh, random one, like this is not, this is off, but like a, like a random shoe company, let's say, like they've been drawing for like, let's say 50 years and they have all of these drawings on file. They're just kind of like sitting there and AI can essentially just unlock the unrealized value in those drawings and provide these personalized models for each situation. So then like, you know, uh, on running, let's say on running, you know, now that I've known how on running has been designing for the past 20 years i can now start generating and stay within the design language of that studio if that makes sense so it is very kind of like what you're saying to speak go back a little bit it is very context aware of where it is functioning so stuff like that is very possible and we're going to see a future soon this isn't really feasible at the consumer level yet but soon like people are going to just be able to train their own models we're all gonna, there's gonna be a daniella model the austin white model the joey like everyone will have their own model and it's going to be a really interesting future that i'm excited for yeah um i got a a, a question I, I already i already know my my answer and thoughts on it but i was curious like there's whenever like ai gets brought up and you see these crazy renderings that look like real a lot from what i've seen is, is footwear stuff but a lot of like real super realistic looking things and there's like there's some people that are embracing it and then there's some people that are scared that it's going to take <laughs> designers jobs. So I want your, want your thoughts on, on, on people addressing the, the, the fear, or like, or even like maybe not take their jobs, but like, Oh, this is a new skill I might have to learn. And the, like the, that sounds like a, a big lift to some people. I don't know. Just yeah. what are your thoughts on that. It's funny. You mentioned that. Um, Cause this is a relatively polarizing technology. You know, it's like, all of a sudden I, I was learning how to render for five years and this thing's just doing it all of a sudden. So I do have sympathy for people that maybe have that feeling. And, you know, we've seen this happen a lot in history where people, when the camera got invented, a lot of painters were really scared that you won't have to paint anymore because it's like, well, if I can just take a photo of you, why do I need to paint it? And instead what happened was it really just changed the way that people paint. We started seeing more sophisticated landscapes, more detailed portraits, because now we have photos of them to reference. So obviously not a one for one translation of what's happening today, but just as far as like, if you look at the principles of that story, new technology like that isn't always meant to 
you know, it may come across as like something dangerous and going to replace us, but I still think it's just going to be another tool within the creative tool set. So, you know, I, it, it, it's it's never here to replace other artists and designers. Now, now when you start using artist names in the prompts and stuff, that's when it starts getting a little bit like, okay, like, um, is this allowed? Like, can we, it's like, is this okay? Like I can put like shoe design concept by Joey Kamez and then it'll like literally try to take your style. And then, so that's a little bit of a gray area that the AI space is trying to figure out right now. Mm -hmm. But I really think a lot of artists and designers should really treat this as, as, as another tool that's just going to empower their already creative process, you know, not a replacement. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Really cool. cool. Um, all right. We have one last question from the audience. Um, can you tell us about the new and even actual non-existent job positions that these technologies will bring? <laughs> um, yeah. One that I've seen pop up is... Uh, a data set curator, a creative data set curator. So, I mean, at least for me, when I used to work, I would spend at least a day or two sometimes before sketching, just curating images that I found on the internet. And now that's becoming more of a full-time thing. Like you're just the curator guy because that the data set is becoming so, so valuable when, when training these models. So data, things are more like high level, like a lot less like detail, like, oh, I, I did the handlebar on the Jeep Wrangler. Like it's like becoming like more, or like high level type things. So data set curator is one um, and a senior prompt artist. That's one that's kind of weird. I saw like a video game studio doing this. I don't think that's gonna be around much longer, but data set curator is an really interesting one that I saw recently. Um, can you tell us about new and even actual amount? Yeah, so that's that's some really interesting stuff that I think we'll, we'll start seeing. Mm -hmm.